All right. Good Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be in Australia again and uh, attend the QEC conference after such a long time. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so today I want to talk about good qubits and good error correcting codes. Uh, this is more of a question rather than me trying to give an answer. Um, also, when I say good qubits, I mean what should be the criteria to characterize a good qubit in terms of error correction. And when I say good error correcting codes, I mean depending on the noise that you have, what is the right code uh, to implement? OK. So when we think about noise, uh, you know you have, you have experiment lists. Uh, you, you make your qubit, and you code the number fidelity or infidelity, which is like a, which is a distance metric. And the lower the infidelity, the better your qubit is. But what I want to uh, send the message is that the fidelity or infidelity is not a good metric. Uh, if you think about error correction, maybe the right thing to think about is the capacity of the noisy uh, channel that acts on your qubit. So let's say uh, if you have a, a IID poly noise channel where uh, each uh, the qubits suffer from poly x, y, or z errors at rates px, py, and pz, uh, then unfortunately we don't know what the quantum capacity is, but we can find a lower bound for it, which is given by the, the hashing bound, which is the formula over here, which is 1 minus this, this strange looking object, which is just the Shannon entropy. Uh, for the probability distribution defi defined by the probability of errors. So the uh, higher this, this quantity, the better, uh, the higher uh, the rate at which you can trans uh, transport, uh, transfer information, pass information through this channel. Uh, you can also have, for example, what is called an erasure channel, where you can think about the qubit uh, 0 and 1 states are replaced by some erasure state. And you, as a user, get a flag that you know that this error has actually happened. So you know the location of the error. We still don't know what actually happened. You still need to go back and fix the qubit. You can also have uh, what is called as biased erasures, where this, uh, you go to the E state only if the qubit had started in the 1 state. Uh, so it turns out that if you have um, erasures, then you can actually exactly know what the capacity of the channel is. So for uh, just the standard erasure channel, the capacity is 1 minus 2 PE, where PE is the probability of an erasure. And for the bias erasure, it's 1 minus PE. These quantities 2 PE and PE are also related to the entropy. So uh, let's look at the capacity plotted for some different channels. Uh, so the red line is for polychannel, uh, a depolarizing polychannel, where the probability of x, y, and z errors are the same. The blue line is for uh, a biased noise channel, where I, where I only have z errors and no x and y errors. And then the green and the uh, orange line are for erasures and uh, biased erasures. So you can clearly see that for the same amount of error, the same rate of error, p or pe, the biased erasure channel has the highest capacity, then the erasure channel, then the poly channel, and then the depolarizing channel. So in this sense, even if you give me one number, the infidelity of the channel, that's not sufficient, because that infidelity would put all these uh, uh, channels on this you know, e uh, equally good or equally bad. But if you think about the capacity, then clearly we have one winner. Um, also. When this capacity uh, crosses the zero line, so when the capacity becomes zero, that also gives you the threshold for error correction. Uh, OK, so let's pl plot the threshold. Let's assume that I have uh, polynoise, and I'm going to assume bias polynoise, uh, where eta is the ratio of the z errors to x and y errors, and p is the total probability of errors. So I can calculate, uh, I can find out when uh, the capacity becomes 0, uh, and that number, the, the p total, the p for which the capacity becomes 0 is the threshold, and that's what I'm plotting here as a function of eta. Clearly, as eta becomes higher, the threshold increases. So the higher the bias, higher is the threshold, easier the channel is for you to error correct. You can do the same thing um, for the erasure and uh, bias erasure channel. So here, clearly, the uh, threshold is 50% for the standard erasure and 100% for the biased erasures. 
You can also have uh, a channel where you have erasures plus polynoise. So you can have erasures at the rate of PE, and then the you have some amount of polynoise if an erasure doesn't happen. And here, you're, uh, in, in addition to the total error rate, which is PE plus P poly, you can define the, error fraction, the erasure fraction. So erasure fraction being one means all errors are erasure errors, and erasure fraction zero means all errors are poly errors. So here again, I can calculate the threshold, again, a lower bound on the, on the threshold as a function of RE for uh, biased erasures and erasures. And again, biased eras erasures have a higher um, threshold for a given uh, erasure fraction. OK. Another nice thing about um, uh, the erasure errors is not only if you compare the plot on the top and the plot on, pl plot on the bottom, uh, you see that the thresholds for uh, bias erasures are really high. Uh, but in general, for erasures, another nice property is that if your code can correct for some number of poly errors, it can correct for twice as many erasure errors. So again, an erasure noise channel is more desirable. So my request to all the experimentalists is that when you give me, when you describe your noisy qubit to me, don't tell me just one number, fidelity or infidelity. Describe, give me some more information about uh, what the, the type of your noise is. At the moment, we only know capacities for very few channels. Um, uh, and in fact, like we don't even know capacities for non-IID uh, channels. So we should, as theorists, look for finding new metrics, which is not a distance metric, but which captures the structure of noise uh, in your system. That metric should be analytically calculable. It should be, you should be able to generalize it to different types of noise channels. And you should also be able to measure it uh, efficiently experimentally in the lab. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't yet know what that metric is. Uh, our suspicion uh, in, in um, uh, my discussions with Steve Flemia has been that uh, it's some sort of an entropy measure. OK. Now, a lot of people uh, design new types of qubits, uh, especially like in the bosonic plat platform. You can, uh, in, in a bosonic qubit, you can design it to have, uh, you know, you, you correct for leading or leading order errors. Um, and if the physical errors become uh, uh, first order corrected, but the remaining errors are second order. Uh, so you can, for example, if, uh, you can have a binomial code where if the physical error rate is p, then uh, after performing error correction on the binomial code itself, the remaining errors are depolarizing in nature and scale as p squared. You can also maybe design a bosonic qubit where the dephasing errors is p squared. Uh, and in the same bosonic system, you could otherwise encode a qubit which has erasure channel or a biased erasure channel where uh, the, the probability scales linearly with p physical. So now the question is, what is the best qubit in your bosonic system? Or this, I'm just giving an example of bosonic platform, but I'm sure in, in your own platform that you work with, there are different ways to encode a qubit. And you need to decide what is the best qubit uh, that you could encode in your system. So if in this case, I plot the capacities as a function of p physical, these are the plots that I get. Uh, so clearly, for low physical error rates, like all of these four channels kind of look similar. But for high enough rates, the bias erasure channel still has a higher capacity than all other erasure channels. So if there are multiple ways for you to encode a qubit in your system, it, with, with such uh, uh, error rates, uh, like I've, I've used here, again, biased erasures wins. So try to design a qubit that has biased erasures. But again, like how your uh, errors scale in your system with the physical error rate can be different. And maybe in your system, it's better to design uh, a dephasing uh, channel rather than biased uh, erasure channel. But it all depends on the details of your system. So again, carefully analyze the noise in your system to decide what's the best qubit you can make. OK, so it seems like the biased erasure channel is really good. Um, so here, we present a 
uh, work uh, in collaboration with Jeff uh, Thompson's group from, from Princeton, where we design a qubit in our neutral atoms, where the dominant, erasure, uh, the dominant noise channel is biased erasures. So what is this qubit? So this is different than the neutral atom uh, qubits that you've been uh, hearing about in the last few days. So the idea is to encode the qubit in the metastable states of your atom rather than the ground state of your atom. So I, I choose these metastable states. Uh, I, can't, I just call them 0 and 1, whatever these states are. And they still have long lifetimes. Um, so when the qubit is in these metastable states, they don't really interact with each other. So if you want to do gate operations, you again excite uh, the qubit into the Rydberg state. So in particular, you excite the one state to the Rydberg state. And that's when the qubits start talking to each other. And you can do uh, gates via Rydberg uh, blockade. So you can do control Z gates, for example. Now, the main source of error is this Rydberg state decaying to other states in the system. For example, it can decay to the ground state of the atom. So now all you do is monitor whether this ground state transition has happened via applying, uh, you know, by seeing a fluorescence, by applying some uh, laser at some specific frequency. So that laser that you apply to check for erasures, which, which I call erasure conversion pulse, that doesn't disturb the qubit if it was in the co computational subspace, but it for, if it had leaked to one of these other states, it will detect it. So this is uh, a biased erasure qubit, because the, um, you, you go to these other subspaces only if you started from the one state, because only the one state couples to the Rydberg state. So the main source of errors here is uh, errors from the two qubit gates. And after every two qubit uh, control Z gate, I, uh, th there's a chance that you know, the atom uh, is, is, it went to one of these other subspaces. I just apply my uh, erasure conversion pulse. And if I see that the atom has actually uh, in one of the ground states or some other state, I put in a fresh atom prepared in the one state and continue with my protocol. You can show that this atom replacement uh, basically looks like an identity or a Z error uh, in your system at a known location. So that's, it's, it's equivalent to applying an identity or a Z error with 50% probability on that uh, specific qubit. Okay, so the noise channel of this control Z gate is with some probability PE. I apply an identity or Z errors on the one of the two qubits. Uh, and if there is no erasure, then I just assume it's a depolarizing noise channel. Uh, in this system, we predicted a um, uh, erasure fraction of about 98%. Uh, recently, uh, in Jeff's group, they actually demonstrated erasure conversion in, in this uh, ytterbium atom qubit. Uh, we are not quite at the 98% level there, but we are getting there, and you can ask more questions about that to Jeff. Um, so since, since our paper, many other uh, people are trying to build erasure qubits. So I just want to emphasize the conditions you need to uh, keep in mind when you uh, design your erasure qubit. So firstly, the pulse or whatever technique you use to detect to, to get this flag that you are erased, it should not disturb, it should be Q and D, it should not disturb the qubit if it was in the computational subspace. It should not add new errors. Only if the qubit was leaked, it needs to say, yes, I have leaked. It should also have good spatial resolution. Um, you know, if there's like 50 qubits, if, if this qubit has leaked, you should know that exactly this qubit has leaked, but not, you know, the neighboring qubits. Um, your, you can obviously have false positive and false negatives. False positives are a bit more tolerable. You, you know, you, it's just like you, you will replace your atom even though it was not uh, erased. Uh, false negatives are a bit more problematic because your atom has leaked, but you don't, you know, you don't know to replace it yet. Um, so this is like a leakage error. But of course, you know, we know techniques to mitigate leakage, like you can have leakage reduction units, or later on I will uh, uh, talk about the measurement-based protocol where this leakage is uh, kind of automatically corrected. Okay, so like I said, there are many uh, qubit platforms since our paper where they have come up with uh, different uh, new uh, erasure-biased qubits. In particular, uh, in the next two talks, uh, Taka and Akshay will uh, uh, deal with uh, superconducting dual rail qubits, which are erasure biased. Uh, I think on 
Thursday, uh, I believe, or on Friday, uh, Alex uh, Kubitska will also uh, give a talk about um, Amazon's work on uh, these dual rail transmont qubits where the dominant errors are erasures. So really nice experimental and theoretical work going on in this direction. OK, so so far, I have talked about good qubits. But even if you have you know, qubits with erasure by, you know, biased erasures or whatever your favorite noise channel is, you still need to find codes that can leverage uh, that noise and uh, perform uh, very well. So for bias noise, for example, if, if you have, say, Z bias noise, then the uh, code of choice um, is, uh, for me at least, it's the uh, XZZX surface code, uh, where the qubits are arranged on the 2D lattice, and your stabilizers are the four-body XZZX operators acting on the qubits around the plaquette. Uh, you can uh, choose the height and the length of this uh, lattice depending on how many X errors or Z errors you want to correct. So if, you, if there's no X errors in your system, uh, there's only Z errors, then you can just have this one line of qubits and it just becomes a repetition code. So the nice property of the XZX surface code and why it performs really well to bias noise, Z bias noise, is that uh, Z errors produce syndromes uh, uh, in, which, which lie on disconnected uh, uh, lines. So a Z error on this qubit, for example, uh, produces syndromes to the left and to the right. A Z error on this qubit also produces syndromes to the left and to the right. To produce a vertical syndrome, you need to have an X or a Y error. And so if your X or Y errors are suppressed, then vertical syndromes uh, don't arise. You only have these um, chains uh, uh, of defects. And it's easier to decode the, uh, these errors. Uh, the XZX surface code achieves the hashing bound for Z bias noise, and in some cases, that it actually exceeds uh, the hashing bound. Remember, the hashing bound is the lower bound on the capacity, so you can actually do better, but it's really hard to find codes that actually do better uh, than the hashing bound, so it's, it's kind of interesting that the XZX code does exceed the hashing bound in some, some cases. Uh, it also achieves the capacity for erasures and biased erasures. Um, and like, like I said, you can uh, also do additional overhead reduction by choosing asymmetric uh, lattices. The issue with the code is that if you want to measure the stabilizers, uh, the, the typical way to do it is you put an ancilla qubit at the center of each plaquette and you do a bunch of control not and control phase gates between the ancilla and the data qubits and then you measure the ancilla qubits. The, the problem here is the control NOT gate, because uh, as you have shown, Z errors during the control NOT gate can actually propagate, in, in some cases, can prop or in most of the cases, can propagate to uh, Y errors after the gate. So a C NOT gate by itself can convert Z errors to Y errors, uh, which means that the symmetry of noise is destroyed, and uh, you, know, you would not really get much advantage with this code. So if you, for, if you want to uh, leverage the XZZX code for biased polynoise, then uh, you need a bias-preserving C0 gate. Um, it has been shown that in strictly two-level systems, bias-preserving C0 gates is not possible. You need to go to continuous variable systems to do this. And we, have, we now have uh, bosonic codes uh, where you can actually do bias-preserving C0 gates. OK. So now, what I want to do is, I want to use the XZX surface code to correct for biased erasures. Why? Because if you remember uh, my control Z gate, uh, I told you that you know, after every control Z gate, I apply uh, erasure detection pulse. And if I detect an erasure, I uh, replace that erased qubit in the one state and continue forward. And this is like an I or Z error. So if I just have I or Z error on my qubits, then I know it's like, you know, I should use the XCZX code because it does good for Z errors. However, remember that I just don't have control Z gates in my circuit. I also have control NOT gates. So the way we do control NOT gates in these uh, Rydberg atoms is to sandwich the uh, control phase gates between two Hadamards. So now if I apply a detection pulse after my control phase gate uh, and replace the atom in the one state, then because of the Hadamard, the Z errors get converted to an X error. So you don't have, so you, 
a lot, for, so on some qubits, you'll have z errors, and on some qubits, you'll have x errors, depending on you know whether the erasure happened in the C0 gate or in C phase gate. So it's not really biased anymore. So then, you know, we were talking with Jeff. Uh, my first uh, uh, reaction was like, this is not going to work because I don't have a bias preserving C0 gate, and I would not see any improvement uh, with the XZX surface code. Well, fortunately, Jeff did not listen to me, and the calculations were done anyways. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, so uh, le let me just uh, go to this numerical plot over here. So I've plot the threshold versus the erasure fraction. The blue dots are when I have unbiased erasures, like remember, remember the standard erasures. And the orange dots are when I have biased erasures, but they can get converted to x-biased erasures in the C0 gates. So if I just look at the blue dots, the threshold does increase from uh, about 1% to, uh, uh, to about 5%, close to 5% as the erasure fraction goes from, one to, uh, uh, goes from 0 to uh, 1. So the, the x-axis is actually 1 over 1 minus the erasure fraction. So uh, when re is 1, the x-axis is infinity. And when re is 0, the x-axis is 1. So I do see that. Firstly, I get an improvement in the threshold, as expected when I have um, erasure errors. Moreover, I get a much larger improvement in threshold if I have biased erasures, even though some of those erasures are being converted to um, uh, x erasures due to my C0 gate. So I, I was very surprised uh, to see this big of an improvement. So you go uh, from a threshold of about 1% to close to 10%. Uh, in this case. And uh, for an erasure fraction of 98%, which is what we expect uh, in, the, in the neutral atom system, the threshold can be uh, close to about 8%. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a big improvement. OK. Um, the, uh, so it's not just the improvement in threshold, but it's also improvement in the uh, logical error rate. So here I'm plotting the logical error rate for different distances of the code as a uh, function of the physical error rate. Um, the solid lines is when I have standard erasure errors, and the dotted lines is when I have poly errors. So firstly, clearly, by going from poly errors to erasure errors, I get a much larger suppression uh, in the logical error rate um, for the same distance and, and same uh, p physical. So that's good. And, and uh, over here, for example, it's almost two, order, two orders of magnitude improvement in the logical error rate. Moreover, if I compare the uh, standard erasure to the biased erasures, I get further reduction in the logical error rate. Um, so, um, so in some cases, it's, it's almost an order of, actually, almost two orders of magnitude here, even. So again, showing that it's better even for logical error rates, not just a threshold, to go from poly noise to standard erasure noise to biased erasures, biased erasures being the best. OK. Uh, so can we do better uh, than, the, than this, the, the results we have so far? So what's disappoint what was a little bit annoying to me was that because my z biased erasures are converting to x biased erasures, I cannot make an asymmetric xzx code anymore. Because I have typically the same number of z errors as uh, x errors, so I need to make the z distance and x distance the same, and so I have to use a square xzx code. So I'm not able to fully um, leverage the symmetry of the xzx code uh, for overhead reduction. So in this sense, can we do better? Can we somehow preserve the symmetry of the XZX code, get high thresholds, and reduce the overhead by making an asymmetric lattice? Um, so the answer to this question is yes. But we have to do a different model of uh, quantum error correction. We have to do measurement-based model of quantum error correction and not circuit-based model of error correction. Uh, so with that, I will introduce the so-called so XZX cluster state. Uh, which is what our measurement-based model of error correction is based on. Uh, so the XCZX cluster state is, uh, if, if you know the regular RG cluster states, it's just a, uh, 
uh, it differs from the RHG cluster state by just local uh, Clifford deformation. So you can think about this whole uh, cluster state uh, as uh, made up of small unit cells. Uh, the unit cell I've shown over here. The stabilizers are the, uh, uh, you can check for errors by multiplying um, uh, measurements of the qubits on the faces of this unit cell. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that in just a second. So in a sense, what this cluster state does is that on the first plane, you, it's like an input XZZX surface code. And now you measure all the qubits, uh, all the uh, qubits that are shown in black dots in the X bases, and all the qubits that are shown in white circles in the Z bases. And when you do this measurement, in effect, the surface code gets teleported. Uh, the surface code from the first layer gets teleported to you know, the final layer. Um, and as you do this teleportation, you need to do error correction. And that error correction is performed by multiplying the x measurement outcomes on the black dot qubits with the z measurement outcomes on the uh, white circle qubits, as I have shown over here, that are on the faces of the unit cell. Even though I've shown a, like a 3D structure over here, you can actually just implement the cluster state you know, you can, with just like a thin slice uh, of qubits. Just, having, just have two layers of these, um, uh, just have two layers of the qubits and just teleport information back and forth in time and build the cluster state that way. Okay, so now what happens to noise in the cluster state? If you have Z errors, uh, only black dot qubits are affected by Z errors. Uh, the Z errors create syndrome in the uh, front, going from front to back uh, on some qubits, and on some other black dot qubits, it goes, creates syndromes going left to right. But on no qubit does it create a syndrome going up and down. So the syndromes that are, create, uh, are generated are only lie in a two-dimensional plane, and this symmetry helps you to do better error correction for Z noise. If you have X errors, then that breaks the symmetry and creates syndromes that goes up and down. But if, you, if these errors are suppressed, then you will still get uh, high thresholds. Okay. So now, we want to use this uh, cluster state for error correction. But the way we will build this cluster state is, you, you, is using what we call hybrid fusion architecture. If you're familiar with the fusion architecture, for example, used by PsiQuantum, it's just a variation of that. So the idea of this uh, uh, fusion, hybrid fusion architecture is that you start with small um, uh, entangled states, several copies of small entangled states, and then you stitch them together using Bell basis measurements, so uh, measurements of two qubit XX and ZZ uh, operators, as well as some additional control Z gates. So in the PsyQuantum work, for example, you only build, uh, you only use Bell basis measurements. In our case, we use Bell Bell basis measurements, and also some control Z gates. And the way we uh, st structure this is such that a biased erasure will only cause Z errors on the uh, black dot qubits, which means that a, bi a physical biased erasure will only create syndromes that lie on a 2D plane, and so I will get a high threshold. Uh, so this is what our resource states look like look like. Uh, it's an, we call it an eight uh, ring resource state. Uh, it has eight qubits in it. And instead of writing the whole state, I can describe the state using uh, its stabilizers. So there are two types of stabilizers here. Uh, for every black dot qubit, I have an X-centered stabilizer. So it has an X acting on the black dot qubit and X acting on its uh, neighboring white circle qubits. And for every white circle qubit, I have a Z-centered stabilizer, which is a Z acting on that white circle qubit and Z's uh, acting on its neighboring uh, black dot qubits. OK, so now how does uh, the stitching, how do you prepare the state? You can just uh, prepare, it's, it's, you prepare every qubit in the plus state. You do some control Z gates, a short depth circuit like I've shown over here, followed by some Hadamards. And then you do your erasure check. If you see no erasures, then you will take these post-selected states and put it into your fusion network to perform Bell measurements and other things. So you have eliminated erasures, basically, 
completely from the resource states that you will use to prepare your cluster state. That's one important point. Okay. So now, how do you um, how how does how do you actually prepare the cluster state? So to do that, let me just look at what happens uh, when you do XX measurements on two white circle qubits. So if I, if I bring two of these um, resource states together uh, and just measure XX operators on the two uh, white circle qubits, then I'm measuring one degree of freedom on two physical qubits. So what I'm left with is one degree of freedom after the measurement. So effectively, I've created a logical qubit, which is secretly two qubits, where the z uh, operator of that qubit is z tensor z of the two secret physical qubits, and the x operator is just x tensor i. Okay, so this xx measurement is basically just fusing the two white circle qubits into one single effective qubit. Okay, so now uh, this happens. When this happens, you also need to apply a uh, a z correction onto the neighboring black circle, uh, black dot qubits, depending on the xx measurement. So if the uh, xx measurement is zero, then you don't apply any uh, poly correction. But if the xx measurement is one, then you apply zz poly correction to the neighboring uh, black dot qubits. Okay. So now imagine I have a single on a single a plane. I uh, place a bunch of these uh, eight ring resource states as I've shown over here. And uh, on the neighboring, so in the staggered manner, and then on the neighboring white circle qubits, I do my XX measurement. So effectively, I've fused these uh, resource states into like a plane, like a larger plane, which kind of already st is starting to look like a larger surface code batch, by the way. Um, and when you do this, you have to keep the track of poly corrections that you're going to apply based on your uh, measurement outcomes. Okay, so now you'll take several of these planes together and stack them on top of each other in a staggered way, such that the holes uh, on one layer overlap with like the crosses in the layer below it. And uh, in this way, the black dot qubits in different layers will align on top of each other. And you just do control Z gates between the uh, uh, neighboring black dot qubits shown by the blue lines over here. So now this completes the construction of the XCZX cluster state. This is the XCZX cluster state. So now remember to actually teleport information and do error correction in the XCZX cluster state. You had to actually measure the white circle qubits in the Z bases and the white dot qubits in the X bases. So remember, the white circle qubits are actually secretly two physical qubits on which you're going to do uh, with, with the uh, z operator as z tensor z. So that means that here, you're going to measure z tensor z uh, in order to actually measure an effective z. But in step two, you actually measured x tensor x. So now the z tensor z and x tensor x combined together is actually your Bell basis measurement or your fusion measurements. You could have actually done these um, uh, two measurements together in step two directly, uh, because the the final measurements actually commute with everything that you're going to do in the in the in the middle steps. So you could have done the fusion measurements at once and done your control Z gates and just done the X measurements on the black dot qubits and the end. So the shortened protocol uh, is actually that you just prepare your post-selected resource state, properly place them um, as I've described. Um, do your fusion measurements uh, and control Z gates, uh, and then finally measure all the black dot qubits in the X bases, and you're done. So uh, let's look at the simplest thing over here uh, for errors. Uh, this, this, the, there's control Z gates happening uh, between the black dot qubits and the neighboring layers. So after every control Z gate, I'm going to apply a erasure detection pulse. And if there is an erasure, I know it's either an identity or a Z error on the black dot qubits. So again, I've only applied a Z error on the black dot qubits. Now what happens if you have a fusion measurement? It turns out that I can design a fusion measurement such that if there is an erasure, if there's a biased erasure on any of the qubits, then it only erases the XX measurement information, but I can still recover the ZZ measurement information. 
Now remember, the xx measurement decides the po poly z correction that I'm going to apply to my black dot qubits. So if I have lost my xx measurements, that means I'll apply a wrong poly z to the black dot qubits. That means I've converted uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, th that means that only black dot qubits are going to get affected uh, by erasures. White dot qubits are not going to be affected by that. That means that the syndromes would be generated in a 2D plane. OK, but let's see what this uh, uh, fusion circuit uh, actually is. So uh, I want to perform a fu fusion measurement on qubit i and qubit j. I will place an ancilla prepared in the plus state, and I will do control z gates, as shown. Um, in between each control z gate, I will have a, a erasure check. I'll measure the ancilla and the x spaces. Um, and so if everything has gone fine, there's no erasures detected, then I, the x spaces measurement of the ancilla will tell me the zz measurement of qubit i and qubit j. I will then measure qubit i and qubit j individually in the x spaces and multiply them together to get the xx measurement, uh, the effective xx measurement. So this, is, uh, this will be a destructive measurement, uh, destu destructive fusion measurement. OK, now if there is an erasure, however, suppose there is an erasure at this point. So then uh, what I will, there's no way for, uh, the, uh, so I, I, there's no reason for me to measure the ancilla in the x spaces anymore. It's, it's not there. So I just go and measure qubit i and qubit j in the z basis. So I can just multiply the z measurement outcomes to get the z, z information. I cannot. There's no way for me to recover the XX uh, measurement information, but I still have the ZZ information. The XX measurement has been completely erased. So in fact, anywhere in the circuit, if you see an erasure, then you just stop the circuit there and just measure qubit i and qubit j in the Z basis. This will allow you to recover the Z, uh, Z measurement information, but it will not allow you to recover the XX measurement information. Uh, so this means that you will apply a wrong poly z to your black dot qubits. Uh, and this is effectively a zz, correlated zz error uh, on your black dot qubits. OK, but again, the, the, the physical erasures have only applied an error on the black dot qubits. And remember, that is exactly what this cluster state was designed to effectively correct. So let's see. In, uh, we, we can numerically simulate this whole uh, thing. Uh, in a circuit uh, based er uh, in a circuit noise model, so every control Z gate has some erasure error, and if it if, if there's no erasure, then we apply uh, some depolarizing poly error to the qubit. So, <clears throat> if uh, if the uh, if re is zero, there's only poly errors, then the threshold is about one percent. Whether you do circuit based error correction or the fusion based error correction, the threshold is about the same one percent. If you did the circuit-based error correction for RE of 98%, uh, the threshold was about 8%, like we saw in uh, one of the previous plots. But now if I do the measurement-based uh, version, this, this hybrid fusion-based version, then I get a threshold of about 10% uh, for an erasure fraction of 98%. Importantly here, the symmetry of the code is completely preserved. I never, if I, for pure Z noise, uh, no vertical syndromes are produced. I can still use a rectangular XZZX surface code and reduce uh, the overhead requirement. So I not only gain an improvement in threshold, but I also uh, gain, I, I re can reduce the overhead by using an asymmetric lattice. Uh, the other nice uh, thing about this fusion-based architecture is that you don't, uh, there's some ease in requirements about real-time atom replacement. Uh, it, it automatically deals with atom loss and, uh, and other forms of leakage. Uh, specifically, if RE was 1, uh, of course, no physical system will ever have RE of exactly 1, but just as a theoretical exercise, if you assumed RE of 1, then the threshold with the uh, fusion-based approach is about uh, 18%. Uh, it was about, uh, it, it saturates to about 10% uh, in the circuit-based approach. So again, this is just showing that the measurement-based approach here is truly powerful. Moreover, with RE of 1 in the measurement-based approach, 
I could just actually use a repetition code. I could just teleport a repetition code rather than an XCZX code. Uh, I could not have done that for the circuit-based approach. For a circuit-based approach, even if RE is one, I absolutely need a 2D lattice. I cannot just use a single line of repetition code. Again, showing the power of uh, the measurement-based uh, approach. So in summary, um, think about uh, the noise structure of your qubits. Don't just think about the one number in fidelity. Also, when you design codes, think about what error is the code trying to correct. Consider developing new, uh, uh, c consider having right symmetries in the code that are designed to effectively detect the specific errors that you're trying to correct. Uh, there's actually nice uh, work uh, from Benjamin, uh, from Ben Brown, uh, related to symmetries and conservation laws uh, in designing error correction codes. I think that's a very nice paper. I urge you to read it. Uh, more uh, just yesterday, we, have, we had a paper out where we used a similar idea of uh, preserving symmetries to actually um, mitigate the temporal boundaries, uh, that the, the issue of temporal fragilities uh, in the XY surface code. Um, I don't have time to talk about that, but if you're interested, please go take a look, and I'll stop here. Hi, thanks for the, the great talk. Um, one thing that I was wondering when, when watching your talk was the noise model that you look at with respect to other kinds of errors that can happen, like measurement errors. And I guess in this setting where you have, um, where you have loss that's heralded, there could also be an uh, you know, incorrect statement from the noise um, about whether there was actually loss or not. Um, and you, I, I don't know if you analyze that, but do you have a feel for whether these ideas would still work in that more general Oh, way? absolutely. So you can have, for ex like, like I, in one of the earlier slides I mentioned, you can have, um, what is it, the positive, uh, false positives and false negatives, for example. So false positives is like there was no erasure, but you detected and er you think you detected an erasure. So you, you will kind of replace the uh, atom back in. Uh, it's it's fine. It, it still works. It just it just is an additional erasure rate, like it's an user induced erasure that you're going to apply. Um, so we just have to account. It's just the, the base the base error rate kind of increases a little bit. Yeah, but nothing goes catastrophically wrong. Like the, nothing goes catastrophically wrong. Yeah. Uh, false negatives is like again leakage, um, and in in this measurement based approach, leakage automatically gets converted to poly errors in the model, which is true in the atomic case where uh, if one of the atom has leaked, and if you try to do a gate to the other atom, basically nothing happens to the other atom. So in, in that way, leakage kind of effectively kind of becomes like a poly error on the uh, other atom. So it kind of automatically uh, gets corrected, but obviously increases the base poly error rate. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, for the noise entropy uh, discussion, I guess, how does things like bias preserving and whatnot fit into that picture and a lot of these more detailed circuit level details? Oh, yeah, great question. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but I think that you, we need some notion of entropy per gate operation or something like that. Uh, again, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. So your, um, the way that errors propagate through the 3D ZX, XZ um, lattice, similar to the RHD lattice, because the errors are propagating only in one plane, I imagine the decoder would have to have different logic. Have you looked at decoder performance for this type of code? Uh, so the errors are not restricted to one plane. The syndromes are restricted to disconnected 2D planes, errors can obviously happen uh, anywhere. And so the decoder is tailored um, to the noise model. So, th so here, like the numerical results I showed, it's, it's just a minimum weight perfect matching decoder. Um, but it's just, it knows uh, that the vertical syndromes are generated at a lower rate than the horizontal syndromes. Yeah. Hi, 
I I also have a similar question related to decoding. So uh, like to uh, so if you look at the mainly in the fusion based, usually uh, how we check about decoding is like we talk about the correlated surface. So here how the correlated surface look like in this picture. I'm not sure I think about it that way. It's maybe we can talk later. I'm I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so I'm wondering then how you check that uh, your decoding is successful or not in your protocol. Oh, I just look at whether I created um uh th whether I have strings going across my lattice or not. Like do I have like x logical strings or z logical strings or other Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.